welcome to 2014. Happy New Year. This is uh, AT&T Threat Track, our program for January 7th, 2014. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. And today we're joined by Jim Clausing, Stan Nerloff, and John Hogaboom. I'm Brian Rexrode. And uh, Jim, let's first go to you. I know uh, we're going to get a chance to talk a little bit about attacks against gaming servers a little bit later on, but um, I guess there are different types of attacks against uh, gaming services, and uh, what can you tell us about some of them? Yeah, Brian, uh, in about a week before Christmas, um, the folks at Kaspersky did a blog post um, looking back at attacks uh, against aimed at gamers in 2013, and they um, they said they had tracked about 4.6 million pieces of malware that focus on gaming, um, and had seen attacks against over 11 million uh, gamers across the around the world. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's it doesn't really come as a surprise to those of us in the business that gamers are targets for a lot of these attacks. Um, what I thought was a little interesting in their, in their article was that uh, more than half of those gamers that they saw attacks against were in the Russian Federation. Um, so, it, and they didn't seem to have any in the U.S., so I'm not sure what's up with that, whether that's just the, you know, where where they're getting their uh, intelligence from, where their software is installed, I'm not sure what that is mm -hmm. exactly. But um, you know, it's, they they seem they've seen a lot of uh, individual pieces of malware that were targeting gamers, trying to get usernames and passwords, uh, and they had a couple of suggestions for users. A lot of the same things that we've been saying for you know since we started doing this program and even before that you know um, especially things like uh, you know if it looks too good to be true it probably is you know if if somebody's offering you um, free access to the the newest latest game that you'd normally have to pay for you know it's probably because it's malware or something wrapped in malware. Um, you know, the second suggestion is use strong and varied passwords in your various accounts. Don't use the same password in all of your games. Don't use the same password in your gaming as in your banking. You know, things that we've been saying for a long time. Um, they suggest good quality antivirus, um, you know, and that's that's always a good thing, but with the caveat that antivirus is always playing a catch-up game, mm -hmm. and so you know you're not going to be protected against the latest and greatest zero-day attacks. But it's it's good to have on there. You know um, they do update their their signatures uh, relatively frequently. Um, you know be careful who you give information to. Um, and you know, only download from legitimate sites. You know, things that we've we've been saying uh, a lot of, about a lot of things. You know, not just gaming, but you know, we say that about mobile apps and that kind of thing all the time. But I, it was it was interesting just the the volume, the numbers that they were seeing. That 4.6 million pieces of malware. You know, I know we see lots of variants of every every brand of, you know, strain of malware that comes out. But I was surprised at the number of different samples that they saw. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, this is somewhat speculative in nature, but, you know, one of the things that, uh, if you've ever watched The Big Bang Theory, for example, there are certainly folks that take uh, their gaming pretty seriously. And, uh, you know, I think to some extent there are organizations or folks that uh, really take it to uh, some of, to an extreme that is uh, to really kind of see how you can get around the rules or do things to uh, be able to subvert your competition. Um, I, I don't know if uh, some of this activity is actually directly related to that, but we certainly have seen uh, evidence of denial of service attacks being used to help interrupt 
uh, gaming activities, perhaps to get an upper hand on the competition. So, uh, you know, yeah, and motivation here. Yeah, one of the things they said, one of the more successful of these pieces of malware was, you know, something that would it was purported to give the user certain elevated privileges or abilities in the game. You know, the gamer is trying to get an edge over their uh, competitors. And so they're likely to, or more likely to fall for something like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think you sort of alluded to another point here is that even uh, what we would might consider to be mundane accounts like gaming or maybe uh, you're part of a messaging forum or something like that, you want to be sensitive about how you protect those passwords because they may provide hints uh, that uh, attackers might use to get more uh, substantial counts such as banking and, and that sort of thing. So it's, I, I would even say this is not just using a different password, but making sure that you can't draw a relationship between the two. And yep. in fact, one step better might be to you even have uh, a little bit of separation in the new usernames or the email account that you use between those. Most ISPs provide the opportunity to use multiple e or provide you know use multiple email accounts, and uh, that may be uh, a little bit helpful as well. Yep. So thanks very much, Jim. That's uh, it's certainly uh, an enlightening article. It, it is a curious observation that uh, they didn't have any cases in the U.S. There was a very heavy bias in Russia and, the, and their uh, statistics associated with that activity. But uh, Kaspersky is a, a Russian-based company, and so that may have introduced some bias in their, in their analysis. Uh, next item here I wanted to share with you is, um, you know, there was a uh, there was a breach that's well known. I think uh, it probably isn't news to anybody where about 40,000 credit cards had been lost uh, in a theft from Target, and these were actually thefts associated with point of sale. That is actually devices uh, that were used to scan credit cards and uh, interact with the payment services uh, from Target stores. So this wasn't actually online. Uh, type activity or necessarily a breach of the database itself. And uh, I think John Hogeboom had covered a topic uh, related to this uh, earlier uh, and, uh, you know, before the, uh, before the end of the year. Now, one of the things that uh, came up was an article that um, this actually was on Today Money, and uh, it, the description here is five lessons learned from Target, the Target security breach. And this is more of a... Um, Oh, yeah, I may have uh, misstated, is actually 40 million credit cards and uh, debit cards that were lost rather than 40,000. But uh, back to the uh, sort of the point here, this particular article is looking at the uh, issue more from a uh, financial protection point of view, not necessarily uh, looking at it from a cybersecurity point of view. Uh, we're not necessarily taking this program into the financial protection area, but there were actually a couple of things here that I found to be uh, enlightening and perhaps uh, worthy of uh, sharing with folks here. So first of all, um, one of the first uh, lessons here is that uh, credit cards offer better fraud protection, and this is in comparison to uh, debit cards. Uh, again, the information that was lost in this case was uh, debit card information and credit card information from point-of-sale services. Uh, there are regulations that require that uh, you're only liable for the first $50 in fraudulent cases associated with credit cards so long as you adhere to some reporting requirements. That is, I think it's a 90-day uh, requirement that is once you receive your, uh, it could be 60 days, but once you receive your bill uh, and you re review that bill, if there are any uh, credit or charges that you would prefer to to dispute, you can raise that to the credit card company, and uh, there is a limited um, limited liability from your point of view. In fact, what I've been generally told is that uh, some credit cards actually provide no liability associated with fraudulent charges so long as they're reported, and in fact, even ones that don't provide that formally, uh, oftentimes you can negotiate it to be uh, covered. So that's a... Uh, an important distinction between credit cards versus debit cards and, and use. Next one is that, uh, you know, I think Target offered a free credit monitoring services associated with this event. I think it's a really good gesture. I think that's what the article kind of alluded to as well, but the, the, I think the significant point is it probably won't protect much in this case. And the point being is that uh, credit monitoring service is actually looking at your credit rating activity, and that has more to do with whether you pay off your credit card has very little to do, or perhaps uh, you know, what credit liability they have 
but it has very little to do with activity associated with specific credit cards that might have been lost. So uh, that is actually uh, not going to help very much, like I said, a good gesture. Uh, more important in this case would be if you suspect that your credit card had been stolen to get that card replaced. And then similarly, uh, the third lesson here is that uh, security freeze, one of the options that you have with a, your credit rating is to freeze access to your credit rating so that no new accounts can be set up. Well, in this case, it was credit card information that was stolen, not necessarily your social security card. There wasn't necessarily evidence of any uh, new accounts being trying to uh, being set up, and there was in actually information lost that would be helpful for that. So again, this is a case where uh, a credit freeze probably isn't going to help you very much. In fact, uh, if you wanted to set up a new credit card, that might in, in fact inhibit your opportunity to do that. Uh, fourth item here would be, um, you know, the question is raised whether you should change your PIN on your debit card. Um, Technically, as I understand it, the PIN information itself was not lost. Uh, an encrypted version of that was lost. So there is a perhaps a slight possibility that it would be possible to guess what the PIN number is. Uh, it might be just as easy to try to uh, exhaustively guess what the PIN number is. Uh, so changing your PIN is fine, but I think the uh, article points out a subtlety that's important is that it is possible to use debit cards without even having the PIN. So uh, it's uh, whereas the PIN helps to protect if you're going to an ATM, for example, it probably isn't going to help too much for uh, things like online purchases. So uh, best would be to uh, get the debit card replaced or perhaps consider not using a debit card. And then uh, last but not least, uh, the question was raised about whether it's uh, safer to choose credit or debit when you're using a debit card. And again, in this case, uh, if it's a debit card, it's still a debit card. Uh, choosing credit really doesn't make much difference. And in this case, in fact, the numbers were lost. And so uh, the numbers associated with a debit card aren't going to really protect you if you choose to use it as a credit card. So uh, the same sort of liability applies whether you use it as a credit card or as a debit card. It's still a debit card in terms of the regulation and rules around it. So uh, anyway, those are some lessons that uh, that were shared in that article. I thought they were actually quite uh, insightful, and uh, I learned a few things from it, so I thought we'd share it with you. Yeah, I, I thought it was uh, interesting that, and something that I hadn't really thought about, but you know, the number points four and five there actually go together. That's mm -hmm. exactly what they were saying is, you know, you can use the debit card. If you choose credit, then it asks you to, for a signature rather than a PIN. Well, you know, so then you're just scribbling something down on the piece of paper, and that's the point they're making, that the, even if they didn't have the PIN, if they've got the number, they can still use it. Right. Absolutely. So, uh, again, uh, uh, good, some good considerations when uh, making it. You know, and just as a side note, I have uh, some family and friends that are very reluctant to do online purchases. Um, the... You know, I think that's actually uh, a little bit unfounded in the sense that, you know, your financial activity is available online anytime you go to uh, any store. Uh, there are electronic transactions associated with any kinds of purchases that you're performing. And, uh, and so, you know, whether you're purchasing something online through your own computer or through someone else's computer, I think it has very little to do with uh, the, the protections that are around that particularly from a financial point of view. Obviously, you know, there might be some uh, security aspects of the systems themselves, but in the end, what you want, really want to do is make sure that you have some protections around how you perform those functions. So uh, reviewing the bill, uh, making sure any uh, potentially fraudulent purchases are, re are reported quickly, and uh, managing those is uh, probably the best strategy. And, you know, Brian, um, I always use credit cards. I've never used my debit card um, for any kind of either in-person or online purchase. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing I, I would mention about credit cards that there are some providers out there, um, particularly for the online stuff, where um, certain credit card providers and banks will allow you to create kind of a virtual credit card dynamically and use that credit card number um, on your online purchase. And then it gets tied to that particular provider, too. So if someone happens to steal it and tries to use that virtual credit card uh, for at a different store, it won't work. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. That's something that people could look into. If they're hesitant, you're talking about people are hesitant about doing online purchasing and whatnot. Um, if they are, that's a, a 
one possible solution that at least gives me peace of mind when, when I'm doing online purchasing. Yeah, good, good point, John. Thank you. Okay, so with that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a, uh, a related topic. And uh, Stan, there's uh, always somebody that's willing to take an extra measure to inject a little malware. Is that right? That's right. Um, well, I think we've heard this type of story before, uh, which is uh, malware that affects ATMs. Um, and I think one new twist to the story is maybe uh, the way that you get access to the money um, well, with this malware version. So just the basics for now, there's an article, uh, there's actually several articles, um, one in the BBC and uh, one from Security Magazine um, that, that kind of both have a similar story uh, about malware that's transmitted using USBs and it affects uh, ATMs that are running like Windows XP or something like that. And basically, the, once the malware is installed, um, the perpetrators are able to use the pin pad to enter some special 12-character uh, number that gives them access to a hidden um, menu. And in that hidden menu, uh, they're asked for an authentication code, and they have to call one of their crook buddies um, to, uh, you know, give them that code, and then they get a, 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 like a, a response to the challenge that they have to enter into the ATM. And once they've done that, um, they're able to uh, get access to basically the money retrieving functionality of the ATM. So the software, the malware, will enumerate all of the bills that are already loaded in the ATM um, from highest values, you know, how many, uh, like, I guess if, if there were different uh, denominations present in the ATM, uh, you know, it would list how many bills of each denomination there are and then allow the person to probably uh, take out money from of the highest denomination first um, and then work their way down. Uh, this type of malware has been talked about um, and uh, in the Chaos Computer Club, I think in Germany, there's a conference uh, every year, so there's some researchers there who didn't want to be identified <laughs> that talked about reverse engineering this malware um, and it's, uh, they did mention this very interesting feature of, you know, the, the crooks not even trusting each other. That's why they have this uh, challenge and response protocol. So there's a, a, a two-crook buddy system uh, before you can access the malware, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the money extracting function from the malware. This way, I guess one crook can't steal the USB stick and, and, and go on his own way, so to speak. Right. Uh, so I thought that was a very interesting twist. There's been other uh, malware like this that's uh, used uh, CD-ROM uh, drive to load the malware into the ATM mm -hmm. and then use the boot order attack uh, to do something similar uh, to load the virus. So obviously, uh, you know, for ATM manufacturers, they have to be cognizant of these things, disable anything in the... Uh, bootloader that would prevent, uh, you know, loading from a USB stick or uh, a CD-ROM drive and, and really actually hiding those interfaces. Uh, like in a bank, I would expect that to be, you know, in the part of the ATM that is not accessible, like somewhere in the back where they load the money. But I guess there's also, like, these standalone ATMs, and, and maybe um, in those they have to probably secure, uh, you know, the USB port or the CD-ROM drive a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, interesting. I, that, uh, I do like the challenge and response part of the malware. I, I thought it's kind of clever that the crooks can't even trust each other. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, that, that you know, and it, this kind of suggests to me that there's so, some. I mean, it, it's, there's an awful lot of insight into how these ATMs are working. There has to be some sort of uh, inside support associated with these, so right down to the point where they're actually uh, going to the point of uh, the. Defeat, you know, drilling holes to get to the USB port, and knowing where to drill the hole in a particular installation, and how it's going to how it's going to behave, getting access to the uh, to the you know the control aspects of the system. I don't know. What are your thoughts about that? Well, actually, uh, they did make reference to that in the uh, in the article, and I tend to agree. You know, uh, that that would be the best way to write the malware. Uh, is if you had some insider knowledge. Um, some clues uh, when they did reverse engineer the malware that they had was that the code was, they said, cleanly written, 
and it wasn't, didn't seem to be the first iteration. So it did seem like they had insider knowledge. For example, uh, uh, a, a particular strand of the malware you know, infected a specific type of software that, that's installed on ATMs. So somebody would have to have knowledge of how that worked, where the load points for the software were, and that software wouldn't just be, you know, uh, available anywhere on the Internet. You obviously have to be working with the manufacturer or you'd have to be part of the uh, supply chain there at some point or the, mm -hmm. the, the development process. It, it would be very hard to uh, reverse engineer something like that. You'd almost have, you know, you'd have to buy your own ATM machine um, which I, maybe is feasible, and then, uh, you know, take it apart. Um, but uh, it, it's, you're probably going to get better results uh, if you had somebody on the inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it actually reminds me, uh, going back to, uh, you know, years ago I was working on cryptographic systems, and uh, there were some tricks that we did to uh, provide tamper protection on cryptographic systems to make sure that they could be tampered with or and uh, inadvertent ways. And so this is actually kind of an in or in subvertive ways. Uh, this is actually uh, kind of reminiscent of that, that, uh, you know, physically defeating systems that try to get to, or, or penetrating systems that try to get to, uh, you know, pieces that weren't intended to be accessible from uh, your common user. Right. And I think for system designers, it's important to consider uh, things like that, uh, that you wouldn't, you know, you, they, the software might be hardened and it might be, secure in a sense that it's not easily accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, but then what are the interfaces, like the USB port, the CD-ROM drive, are those uh, well protected in the system? Uh, mm -hmm. It's something, you know, you have to look at the system holistically when you design it and make sure that you've thought of um, all of the details of how an attacker might uh, try to uh, get at it. Yeah, and what better way to learn than the school of hard knocks? So with that, let's go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about some knocks. Uh, John, um, we've had some uh, new types of denial of service attacks showing up. Uh, we've talked about them a little bit before, but I think this kind of reinforces that a little bit more. Uh, yeah, thanks, Brian. So uh, we have talked about this, I'm pretty sure, on the show, notably in the Internet Weather Report. I think we probably talked about this. Mm -hmm. um, but in any event, what, um, what's been being reported, and we're seeing this as well, is um, that attackers are using the NTP, Network Time Protocol Service, to commit reflection attacks, much in the same way that DNS has been used historically. And um, uh, we have a, I have a picture here, actually, of the upturn of it here. So you can kind of see this is the past 30 days, and we've even been reporting it even probably prior to this, that we've seen intermittent kind of... Uh, uh, spikes in activity, but you can see it's really uh, ramped up since probably about uh, Christmas time or so, around the 24th, 25th or so. Um, there's been a great deal more uh, NTP reflection attacks occurring uh, since that time. Most of them, uh, you know, I'll note is uh, related to targets that are related to gaming. Um, I'm not going to name any particular names, but you can go out there and look on the internet and kind of research that. If you look up NTP reflection attacks, I think you'll find some. Uh, uh, some articles and some people claiming that they've attacked some, uh, you know, higher profile gaming sites. Mm -hmm. So just real quickly for those, I think most people that watch the show probably know what NTP is, but if you don't, uh, it's basically a UDP-based network protocol which allows it to be spoofed, you know, so you can do spoofing because there's no connection handshaking going on like there is with TCP. And basically what it does is allows for computers to do time synchronization with each other. So a computer like yours uh, might ask a NTP server what time is it, and then the NTP server comes back and tells the machine what time it is so you can set your clock. And, there, you know, the National Institute of Standardization of Time, they have time servers. A bunch of other large providers have time servers, and they're very accurate down to, you know, tenths of a second. So you can, everybody can have their machines uh, time sync to very close times together. So the question probably people are asking, so how do, you, how do you reflect NTP responses much in the same way that you do DNS responses? Uh, so here I kind of show an attacker at the top left, and his real IP address might be 10.10.10.10, but he creates these packets that have a spoofed source IP of who he wants to attack. And in this case, we're just going to put in 192.168.1.1, and he asks the question to the NTP server, what time is it? 
But now when the NTP server responds, since the source IP was uh, spoofed, he responds to someone else who is the real intended target here. Now, case in point, this doesn't really amplify. There's not a lot of uh, attack here like you normally with DNS. Your small query goes out, you get a large DNS response back. With this type of query, it's about a one-to-one -one type of uh, response activity. So what they've done uh, is they've noticed that these attackers, the way they're amplifying their attacks is they're using a special kind of, most people don't know about this feature, but in NTP servers, usually older ones, um, they have a feature to call the, uh, the monlist function, which allows you to get a list of the last 600 IP addresses who have requested to time sync to that NTP server. So what they're doing here in actuality to do this amplification is they do the same thing they did in the previous slide, but they're, they're passing in the mon get list function. And that's a really small question. It's only about 48 bytes. But the response that the NTP server sends back is about 40,000 bytes, give or take, depending on how many, you know, how many of those 600 are in the list. You know, maybe it doesn't have that many. Um, so the victim is getting inundated with a factor of about 900 times uh, the amount of traffic is what the attacker actually has to send out. So he can send very small responses, which in turn send large responses back to the victim. And then, of course, he would do this to many, many, many different NTP servers that he's located out on the Internet, and all of those NTP servers are responding back to, uh, to that one victim, and he gets in. He basically just gets overloaded uh, network saturation. Right. And, you know, John, I think you're going to kind of transition into this, but I think it's probably it's worthwhile to point out that it was back, I think, in 2010, this fundamental problem was recognized mm -hmm. as a vector for attack. And so there was a patch that was put out, and uh, I think you're going to go into that a little bit more. Yeah. So there is a patch that was put out. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to mitigate this. If you are running NTP, so there's a few things, first of all. Um, if you're running an NTP server that is internet facing, such that anybody on the internet can NTP time sync to it, first you might want to, you know, take recommendation three: filter and block any activity to your NTP server to only expected source IPs, such that you know your certain organizations that you trust source IPs are allowed to connect to it. Uh, but there's also cases where people are running NTP servers that they don't even know they are. Uh, there's a lot of these embedded home routers and whatnot that might have a bug that on their WAN interface, they're listening NTP, you may not even know that. I don't really have a good recommendation on how you find out if you do or not, um, uh, but that is another possibility. The right thing to do if you're running NTP and you know you're running NTP on a server is to upgrade to at least 4.2.7 where they removed that monlist function and they've replaced it with a much more uh, much more a, a nicer version that's not you know uh, prone to abuse like this. Uh, I forget. I think it's called something run list or something. Um, or if you can't upgrade to NTP 4.2.7, you can go into your NTP server, the Etsy NTP.conf configuration file, and add in a line that says disable monitor, which will disable this function and won't allow anybody to do that kind of query. Uh, so that's you know the two kinds of recommendations. Ultimately, I would say is unless you mean to be running NTP, you know, internet facing on your network, uh, you, you probably want to, you know, shut that down um, because that's what we're seeing. We're seeing lots of IPs out there that probably people are legitimately running NTP for their organization, but they're allowing anybody on the internet to NTP time sync to it, and they're, you know, maybe not one of these larger, you know, they're not the National Institute of Standardization of Time. It's these other smaller little companies that have their own time servers running. And uh, they're being abused by these attackers who are using those, uh, you know, Internet-facing NTP servers to reflect attack traffic. Right, right. Well, not, uh, you know, I, I, I almost feel like a broken record here, but, you know, we've talked many times about devices and uh, the you know, patch processes associated with those devices. Uh, you pointed out here that there's been a patch available for this for some time. Mm -hmm. uh, NTP has been relatively, you know, considered to be relatively stable protocol, uh, but they did identify what could potentially be a security issue. And, you know, it's actually kind of um, uh, interesting, you know, a, uh, an official vulnerability associated with a, an SVE uh, type um, a vulnerability 
uh, record was only generated for this, I think, in the last week or so. So uh, this wasn't actually considered an official vulnerability. It was identified as a bug in NTP fixed uh, at least three years ago, 2010, 2011 timeframe. And uh, now it's getting exploited in uh, a reasonably large uh, volume. And what we're finding is that there is a possibility that there are a number of devices out there that uh, just don't have patch management processes, and even though this patch has been available, haven't been updated to, uh, to reflect in the newer version of NTP that protects against this. So uh, these are the kinds of things that really, uh, you know, fundamentally need to be improved in the industry related to, uh, you know, systems with embedded software. Yeah, right. well, and even... You know, NTP is something that's really common on Linux, you know, on distributions, mm -hmm. and, um, and and they don't necessarily always upgrade to the latest and greatest right away. They go with what's stable. Mm -hmm. So uh, you may see some of the Linux distributions have patches for this in the near future because right. they, you know, for example, my Linux distro that I run at home that I won't identify right now, uh, is is still on 4.2.6, mm -hmm. um, and you know that this it's been out for a couple of years. It's this, you know a stable long-term release kind of thing. Um, so whether whether or not they've actually patched this vulnerability without updating to the latest version, I don't know. Right. But so we may see some some patches coming out for the various Linux distributions to deal with this too. And Brian, I just wanted to make a few points as well. Uh, the CVE number, which you refer to, uh, the official one is CVE-2013-5211. That's the number that was assigned. <laughs> and another point is that this issue was actually originally recognized as a privacy issue as well, uh, mm -hmm. besides just uh, uh, an amplification D uh, DDoS type of issue. And that was because, uh, you know, you could get a list of the last 600 people that connected to an NTP server. Um, there's some, some other information that uh, I read online that said that there are certain types of uh, routing devices that when you turn on the NTP client capability on that device, it actually also turns on an embedded NTP server um, without possibly the user knowing, um, and those kind of devices could be out there on the Internet. So yep. those are just some things um, that we're able to uncover about this uh, issue. Yep, absolutely. Good point, Stan. Thank you. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the uh, Internet weather for the last week or so here. Uh, aside from the fact that uh, I think uh, at the top of the list, what John had pointed out, was the, uh, the growth in uh, NTP-related denial of service attacks. Uh, we do have some scam probe activity on port 2967. Uh, this is associated with the uh, Symantec System Center, which is basically a, a uh, client management uh, protocol that's used for managing uh, antivirus on, uh, with Symantec antivirus products. Uh, this, there have been some vulnerabilities associated with this dating back some time. Uh, I'm not quite sure why we're seeing sort of a resurgence in activity here. It's a single IP address from China that's uh, doing on this, this scanning activity and uh, that IP address appears to be focused on this particular port. So it's not as if they're doing sort of broad scanning across the number of different ports and uh, uh, potentially looking for things. So there seems to be some uh, reason they might be interested in this. Hopefully it's not a new vulnerability that's, uh, uh, that they have uh, plans to exploit or anything of that sort. Next item here is scan probes on port 1080 TCP. This is associated with the SOX application basically to be able to uh, uh, relay applications through servers. And um, most of the probes here are either from the Netherlands or China. There were actually a number of other uh, sources, but the uh, uh, vast majority of probes were, that we're observing in terms of the spike of activity in the last few days uh, are associated with uh, probes from uh, actually a single address in the Netherlands and a single one in China. We want to sort of keep a, uh, an eye on that. You know, oftentimes these uh, SOX servers are being looked for so they can, uh, you know, perform some anonymizing activities, particularly if it's not one that's uh, readily recognized as, as existing. Uh, next item here, scan probes on port 161 UDP. Uh, that's a simple network management protocol. We've reported this generally in the past related to, again, reflection attacks. So anytime we have a server application 
that's associated with UDP that allows the source address to be spoofed and uh, consequently the response to go to another uh, another target. SNMP is a little trickier to use because there are some uh, some what I'll describe as mild protections around SNMP and uh, uh, most uh, applications uh, that have SNMP enabled on them are sort of readily known that you don't really want to expose that to the internet. But there are some cases where it's out there and we have seen uh, denial of service attacks using SN uh, SNMP service uh, as well as uh, character generator, as well as, uh, you know, we talked about the NTP and uh, DNS reflection. And uh, so we want to be mindful of all of these applications that are doing this. This appears to be reconnaissance activity and in this particular case, it uh, looks like uh, most of the probes were from a uh, single U.S. source doing that. And I'm referring more specifically to the activity in the last day or so, um, on January 6th and going into the 7th. Uh, looking at the most probe ports, this is specifically for January 6th yesterday. Uh, on the top of the list, we have port 80 TCP, uh, perhaps probing around looking for uh, web servers that aren't necessarily accessible from, uh, from search engines. Uh, we still have the uh, normal port 445 TCP. Yes, config is still out there. And we also see some probing activity on port 135 TCP. Um, and uh, that is a little surprising to me, particularly the, the proportion of the activity here, uh, partly because I kind of seen uh, port 135 as being uh, sort of depreciated in terms of uh, a particular target for uh, vulnerabilities. but. Uh, there it is, it's showing. And uh, we see the port 53 UDP, uh, most likely associated with DNS reflection attacks, port 22 TCP, uh, that's SSH oftentimes looking for uh, weak passwords, as well as port 3389, uh, that would being a remote desktop protocol, more of the same, looking for weak passwords. And we have a couple of ports here, actually a few ports associated with the zero access spot net. We're going to take a really quick look at that in a moment. Uh, again, going on to uh, the most sources doing probing activity, uh, port 445 at the top of the list. Uh, again, these uh, config infections. And then next in line, uh, we see the zero access. Uh, and this is the peer to peer activity associated with the zero access botnet. That's 16464 UDP, 16470 UDP, 16471 UDP, and 16465 UDP. And uh, we're going to take a quick look at the activity on the zero access botnet because there's a little bit of some interesting information related to that. And we also have um, showing up in here, again, port 80 TCP and port 80 80 TCP, which is uh, basically an alternate port for, um, for uh, web. Uh, that's, again, we're looking at the most sources that are doing the probing here. So that kind of suggests either two possibilities. One is that there is a botnet that is, that is doing this probing activity. Uh, sort of uh, suggestive of some malicious intent associated with that. Uh, the other possibility is that there are just uh, is a lot of interest in doing this. Uh, I tend to uh, sort of cite, maybe I'm a conspiracy theorist, but the, uh, I tend to cite on that, that there might be a botnet that's uh, perhaps maybe even looking for vulnerable servers to, uh, to infect. Okay, so it's worthwhile to take a little bit of a look at the history of the activity associated with the zero access botnet. Um, Recall back in uh, about the uh, July timeframe, Symantec had done a takedown activity. It did have some uh, effect on the operation of the zero access botnet, but it came back in near the end of August timeframe, actually in full force around September. We saw a lot of growth activity extending up into uh, basically peaking out about the middle of November, at which time a, uh, I think late in November, Microsoft did a takedown activity. Again, trying to inhibit the command and control. And one of our observations was at the time that it did that takedown activity, the Microsoft takedown activity, did not have a significant impact on the P2P activity for the botnet, uh, at least in terms of the volume activity that was taking place. But since then, uh, what we're seeing is a significant uh, sort of downturn in the amount of P2P activity. And this may be a result of um, having stagnated the version of, south, of malware that's out there, so with zero access, uh, developing antivirus signatures and being more successful, perhaps identifying that on computers uh, and through remediation processes. And it seems to have leveled out over the last about week or so here, um, extending uh, back to around the Christmas time frame. We seem to uh, see sort of a, a leveling out in the amount of remediation that's been taking place 
or the reduction in the P2P activity on the zero access botnet. So uh, we'll have to keep an eye on this and see if the uh, the, the progress at uh, getting rid of the zero access botnet continues, if they are able to continue to uh, suppress the command and control associated with it, and uh, we're certainly hopeful of that. So that's our show for today. Uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can get in touch with us through email. It's at threattrack at list.att.com. And uh, you can also uh, reach to us through Twitter. Our handle is at threattrack. Uh, the threattrack video is available from the ATT Tech Channel. It's att.com slash threattrack. It's also available on YouTube. And you sub can subscribe to an audio-only version on iTunes. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Happy New Year. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Jim Clausing, Stan Erlov, and John Hogaboom for your inputs and your discussion here. We'll be back next week with a new episode. Until then, keep your network safe.